Welcome to the round table. We're glad you're joining us today. Uh, this is in uh, Grace Bible Church Studio 5B. And uh, we have a special edition of the round table today. We wanna be talking about some of the issues that are going on, contemporary issues in our culture. And uh, we, we want to be able to talk about it through the lens of scripture, but also be very honest and open about it. So we are glad that you have joined us today. Uh, let me introduce my guest to you. You know, Pastor, Assistant Pastor Bobby Locklear, and he's joining us today. And also we have Deontay Partee, who has uh, been a teacher here at Grace Bible Church as well, and uh, really appreciate their friendship and their brotherhood in the Lord. And we look forward to having a good open uh, discussion today with the Word of God guiding us in, in everything that we talk about. So. Thank you for joining us and I look forward to inviting you into our conversation. And uh, let me just begin by saying if you would like to interact with this, uh, you can do so by uh, emailing me at pastor at gbcnc.org. And we would love to hear from you if you have some thoughts or questions to follow up on this. And I'll present that again after our discussion is done. But uh, let me begin today by looking at a text of Scripture. It's James chapter 2, and uh, we're just going to look at the first five verses of James chapter 2, and, uh, and then we will launch into our discussion. And uh, Deontay, would you be so kind as to read James 2, 1 through 5 for us? My brother... Do not hold your faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ with an attitude of personal favoritism. For if a man comes into your assembly with a gold ring and dressed in fine clothes, and there also comes in a poor man in dirty clothes, and you pay special attention to the one who is wearing the fine clothes and say, you sit here in a good place, and you say to the poor man, you sit over there or sit down by my footstool. Have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil motives? Listen, my beloved brethren, did not God choose the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those who love him? That's a good text of scripture and very helpful and insightful. So the word, uh, yours, your word that you used is personal favoritism. In my translation, the word is partiality. Uh, that, is, that is something that is existing very much in the human nature. And um, if, if we were to put a word on that today, which is a very, very hot topic, the word would be racism, right? Because that's, that's the issue of the day. And, and so that's what we need to talk about. But racism is, it's, it's and that can mean different things to different people, but that's one manifestation of the issue that we're talking about here. Uh, so if, if, if James says, my brothers do not show partiality as you hold your faith, um, the word partiality there is an inclination to dehumanize someone else. Um, we were talking about this before and you have experienced mistreatment. You have experienced mistreatment. I actually grew up in another country where I was the minority. Uh, that just messes with people's minds to think about me saying that, right? But, you know, um, the, there's something that's going on in the human nature, um, and that is the inclination to dehumanize. And, it start, and studies have even shown that it starts very, very young, not racism per se, but the idea of seeing somebody who looks different and in your mind thinking that they are less than you are. Yeah. That's... Yeah, identifying with groups, uh, whether it's cultural, economic, as in this case, you know, yep. um, we, we talk about racial. And I, I, you know, I've always been uncomfortable with the concept of like, like there's multiple races of, of human beings, like there's a single human race, but that's as we use it at the street level, racism might like take in someone's skin color, their identity, and we treat them or dehumanize them on the basis of how they appear. Um, but like self-interest is always kind of the thing. It's like, so in this passage, someone is being partial to another person 
for their own gain. You know, kind of protecting one group and oppressing another. Being willing to oppress another group, whether through your actions, through your words, through your negligence, um, to, to prefer your own group. Yeah. Um, and we see that playing out in so many ways today, not just in terms of judging people by their skin color, or their culture, or whatever, but even in terms of their ideology. If you don't share my, ide my ideology, then you are less of a person than I am, and I have a right to be hostile against you or to mistreat you. And, and so we're seeing that played out in, in, so, many, in so many ways. So if, if someone is, is different, than I am. They look different. They think different. If someone is inconvenient to me, um, they become, an, if, if they're different than I am, they become an inconvenience to my sense of how things ought to be, right? And so I, in the ba it's, it's human nature that in the back of my mind, it's okay to treat them poorly. And that's, that's dehumanizing someone. And what, that's, what does that do to the image of God, Deontay? Oh, it, I mean, it destroys your view of that person as an image bearer of God. Uh, you see them not as an equal. You don't see that person who you're thinking less of as saying, this is a fellow image bearer of God whom God created, who I'm supposed to love and respect and fight for and defend. You think of them as less than. You think of them as, uh, you can say, a lower uh, species you know, lower kind, you know. And unfortunately, history shows a lot of that, doesn't it? Yeah. And there is a lot of history that has to be reckoned with there and dealt with because uh, that, that, what that kind of thinking has been, has been very, very real in history. And to some degree, it's still real in the back of many people's minds, you know. And, and some of us may have grown up in Christian cultures where that was even a part of our Christian culture. You know, where those who are different, we, we group them, we label them, and we think of them as those people. And that's just another form of partiality. Even in terms of, you know, a religious uh, point of view, if, you know, since they're not Christian, then they're somehow less than. Um, instead of saying, hey, how can I bring the truth of God uh, to this fellow image bearer? We're thinking, you know, uh, they're a heathen, you know, away from me. You know, you're not welcome here in this church. Um, so it, it strikes home on many levels, including in uh, the local churches, uh, that ideology of and That's why like, the language here reminds me of some of the language in the Old Testament about mm -hmm. the care of the stranger. You know, yes, those who are, yes. God reminds them, you were once a stranger. Yes. And, and so there was a kind of like disposition for hospitality that, and it, it actually goes, even before the foundation of Israel with Abraham, you see the example of the Lord coming to visit. And what does he do? He's like, let's get things ready. We're going to fix a meal. And that's sort of like over the top level of hospitality. Um, there's, a, there's a disposition to kind of counteract the, the very kinds of partiality that's sort of innate there. And it seems like our culture kind of has a, a reverse now. It's a reverse stance to where it's like if you are out of an out group, there's a kind of polarization there that it's going to take a lot of work for me to be willing to do anything past cancel what you're saying or to push back of what you're saying. Just I have, my my disposition is actually defensive or I'm I'm ready to attack yeah. attack your group. And unfortunately, that becomes the reality where you actually become if if that is your disposition, you become what you are pushing against. In, in a very real sense like that, which is, the, which is the real tragedy of this. And again, these groups I'm talking about, they, they, they happen in all kinds of categories. It's not just kind of racial, racial sort of things, but um, economics, um, polit uh, politics. Um, Political ideology, culture, uh, socioeconomic, which is the example that, that James gives us here. But, you know, what Paul refers to, these are what Paul refers to as works of the flesh, rivalries, dissensions, divisions where we in our humanity, in the brokenness of our humanity, we tend to focus on and augment that which divides us. This is how you're different from me, and I'm going to magnify that, right? And, that, and, and by magnifying that, that's going to give me the right or you the right 
to mistreat me. Or, and, and it can get, and then it just gets into a shouting match of who's right and who's wrong, right? And one, one thing that I'm very, very concerned about, particularly for the church today, is that with the understanding, particularly with, with the glut of news and information that we have, um, and, and it's constant, 24 hours a day, we can get sucked into this tsunami of raw emotions and opinions where it's, where it's all just this mass of shouting matches, talking at each other, arguing who's more right and, and who's better than the other person. And the answer to this is in the gospel. There's nothing going on in our culture today, in our society today, in America in particular, there's nothing going on to which the Bible does not speak. And so we need to speak from the reference of Scripture because the truth of what's going on, whether you're talking about a narrative or you're talking about a system, the opinions, your feelings, truth is not determined by one's experience. It is not experience that determines truth. Truth comes from God. Truth has a name. Truth has been revealed to us. And, and God's revelation, His self-disclosure to us is a fixed, immovable, objective truth and reality. And so with that as our foundation, we need to be able to speak into the lives of other people who might be caught up into this big pool of of, again, raw emotion and even violence that's going on today. And when you acknowledge Scripture as a foundation, I think that's an important aspect to acknowledge that when we're interacting with just everyday um, instances of the kind of hostility that we're talking about, whether online or in person, that foundation is not often shared, right? That the foundation is more often than not, like you mentioned, my lived experience. That trumps whatever you have to bring out of your um, holy book, my lived experience is what matters most. And um, rather than looking at how I can interpret my lived experience from outside revelation. And I think that's one of the, the biggest tasks here for the church is, is actually bringing the Word of God to bear on a culture that no longer recognizes its salience. You know, that it's, it is, um, it doesn't speak to these issues. It's, it's actually not relevant because I have my lived experience and you have yours to build. You have your truth, I have my truth, yes. and you know. Yeah. And yet, you know, as, as we recognize it, that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. All truth is God's truth, but not all truth is God's word. I'm quoting a popular speaker in, in saying that, but you know, as, as we bring our foundation of biblical truth to encounter people maybe who are experiencing these things, it's not like we take the Bible and say, you know, you'd have to believe this, but, but we speak to them from the foundation of biblical truth. In other words, when I encounter somebody who is in this tsunami of shouting matches and they are demanding that I acknowledge and affirm their experience, then I don't just speak to them in a counter fashion, but I, you know, I take the truth and the narrative of Scripture and I seek to understand them and I, I, I lead them, I invite them to consider the things that are being, that are being said here. You know, do they understand what they're saying? How do they arrive at their conclusion? But in my, it, there's so much story in Scripture and we can speak to them in story as well, right? Instead of just cold, hard principle truth, right? I mean, I mean, God's mission is a story of redemption and love and forgiveness and reconciliation. Yeah, and that story works itself out in everyday life. And I think that's the, one of the, the beauties of the gospel that it will be really cool to see the church begin to unpack afresh because so maybe every generation has to rediscover this, um, yes. where we, we can actually see, uh, I like how you make the distinction between just explaining the principles of the gospel to explaining the lived quality of the gospel. Because now, if your experience is your foundation, I can be actually going and showing from Scripture how the Bible embraced as true story 
how that works itself out in my own experience mm -hmm. and how I'm actually, how that interacts my movement and, and purpose and decisions in the world. And so that, that's an apologetic in its own right. What had Ravi Zacharias, as you say, like the, the greatest apologetic is the, the Christian life, the, the lived life, you know, the, the, the principled um, life experience. And that, that's a powerful apologetic that we can um, bring out today. It is, and, and as we communicate, it, it, living the gospel is what needs to happen. People need to see the gospel lived. And again, maybe the church is going to have to be doing that from the margins. Historically, the church has been most impactful from the margins. And, and surely today we see Christianity more and more marginalized. But we need to be able to speak into people's lives and into people's experiences with a foundation of Scripture, but we speak communicating God's heart. And what is God's heart? You brought it up earlier from the Old Testament. And it's, it's manifest, for example, in Leviticus 19, you shall treat the stranger who sojourns with you as the native among you, and you shall love him as yourself, for you are strangers in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. What is God's heart in that? You know, and, and that's, this, is, this is the kind of God. He's not just the, the God who is up there who makes demands. You know, but he, and there's another one in, in Acts chapter 10, Peter opened his mouth and said, truly I understand that God shows no partiality. That's when Cornelius, Peter went to Cornelius, a Gentile, the Jews and the Gentiles hated each other, right? The, the Jews referred to Gentiles as dogs, right? And, and so the Lord directs Peter to this centurion and he and the people in his house respond to the gospel and that's where Peter says, God shows no partiality. The truth of the gospel is for all people. And, and so we, we speak along those lines, the royal law of liberty, the, again, one of the most well-known parables in scripture is the parable of the Good Samaritan. Tell us about Samaritans, Deontay. How did they get along with the Jews? Oh, uh, <laughs> much like uh, today, really. Um, there's separation. Um, the Samaritans, I believe, were half Jews, mm -hmm. half Gentiles, and so um, the Jews uh, who were fully Jew did not recognize them as Jews, and so, uh, you know, they kept clear of them. Uh, it was a us versus them type of mentality, very much so how we have it today. Mm -hmm. uh, and Jesus uh, pretty much crushed that, um, interacting with Samaritans. So he's, he, he tells this parable about this man who gets beat up and he's laying on the side of the road, right? And two very religious people, they were the poster boys of, of what a good Jew ought to be, right? They walk by and then all of a, then comes along this good this Samaritan. You know, now, if you were a Jew listening to that, and Jesus said, this Samaritan comes by and he shows kindness to the man and picks him up, dresses his wounds, takes him to an inn, says, take care of him. What's going on in people's minds when Jesus uses the illustration of a Samaritan doing this? Their narrative is subverted, right? The, the common narrative is subverted by individuals acting, right? Acting according to the principles. And the question that prompted all that was, who is my neighbor, right? The guy trying to justify himself, who is my neighbor? And Jesus shows the extent to which that story can inform a culture. You know, if people acting as individuals choose to act in ways that are morally responsible and acknowledge God's character and kindness to one another. I'm sure that like the Jews hearing about a Samaritan uh, who did this, I'm sure they had an uh, ideology of what Samaritan, a characteristic of what a Samaritan is. You know, they don't, they don't do this, they do that, they right. can do no good. Right. And yet you have the Samaritan you know, portrayed in this parable, I'm sure it shattered a lot of misconceptions um, that they had concerning them. Um, yeah. Jesus uh, was in the great reconciler. Jesus came to reconcile us to God. So reconciliation, it's a word we hear a lot today. Racial reconciliation. Well, reconciliation is a word that's very, very present in Scripture. And of course, the primary and ultimate reconciliation is our reconciliation to God. Um, this is what uh, Paul writes in, in Ephesians 2, For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one, and has broken down in his flesh 
the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. There's a lot of very important words in that. You know, the hostility that exists, are we seeing hostility today? Very much so. Uh, just a little bit, right? Very much so. I mean, that's, there's a lot of hostility going on. And, and not even from those who are tearing down statues, burning police departments, things like that, but also those of us who watch it, we can develop attitudes of hostility towards those that are doing that. So there is a hostility that is going on there, and Christ is the one who offers the remedy to that hostility uh, by providing the, that dividing wall of hostility that he says by providing reconciliation. Um, where, do we, where do we find the necessary truth and remedy you know, we could say, well, you know, the Bible, this is our holy book. Others may not recognize the holy book. And that's okay that up front they may not recognize it. But the truth of the matter is that doesn't take the power away from the scriptures. Though they may not recognize it, it still doesn't rob the scripture of its power. Mm -hmm. And if we are speaking from the foundation of scripture, not just our opinion and experience, if we are speaking the, from, from the foundation of scripture, then that will be planted seed that needs to have the time to germinate. You know, and if we do that with love and compassion and in prayer, then that's going to create something in an individual yeah. life. And that, that's what's, um, that is just so key, the, the concept of, of patiently waiting to see this bear itself out. Because Paul points to this hostility that existed between Jews and Gentiles, and he says it's evidence of God's work, of God's power, that these two people have been united in mm -hmm. Christ. Mm -hmm. And so that vertical dimension has to be there for this for these hostilities to be able to work. And so that's a if there's a, a constant complaint in the church about the sort of hostilities that exist, we're talking now about racial tensions that exist within the church itself, we should at least feel there's a sense of things are not the way that they should be. Right. We need to prayerfully look to these truths in Scripture to work themselves out. And, and um, perhaps those are occasions when we need to take, first and foremost, in the culture where noise and shouting is the, the primary stance, stopping to listen in, in cases of where we're, you mentioned working from the margins. Um, one way to do that effectively is to just get yourself out of the fray and sometimes. And that's what I actually find the most difficult about all of these things because like I've, I've had personal experiences that shape how I interact with these discussions and so I want to be involved and to be invested and sometimes I don't have enough mental space to be able to objectively think about these things, objectively pray about these uh, uh, items in our culture. Um, and at the end of the day when we're planting seed, that happens between individuals. Right? That happens in conversation. That's over the coffee table. That's at the, the cookout in your neighborhood. Right? It's, it's not done over Facebook, at least that I... <laughs> so would you say that something like uh, what's happening there with the racism, would you say that that's not necessarily what we should be focusing on? That racism is just a symptom of something deeper, which is the sinful heart. Absolutely. And so when we implement the gospel in it, we're looking to provide through the gospel a remedy for the disease, not necessarily the symptom. And as long as we're looking at the symptom, mm. which is either racism or, you know, discrimination of any kind, mm. uh, we may cover it for a little bit, but eventually it's going to pop back up mm -hmm. until we get to the root. Mm -hmm. So is that is that the, sure. how and, we can implement the gospel? And, the, and that's a very powerful contrast to all the supposed or ostensible remedies that are being... Yeah. I mean, there really is no remedy that's being proposed today. It's just reaction against. Yeah. There's no real proposition of what we're moving towards. And this is where the church really has something to offer. It is the gospel of grace in Jesus Christ where we are all one in Christ. You know, uh, I like what uh, Rebecca McLaughlin said in her book, Confronting Christianity. The New Testament is one of the most emphatically anti-racist texts 
ever written. Fellowship across racial and ethnic differences is as intrinsic to the message of Jesus as care for the poor. An example of this, uh, Paul says in Colossians, here there is neither Jew or, or Greek, circumcised, uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. What a, what a tremendously powerful text. And that, what that does is that offers remedy that gets right to the heart of the individual. It's not just dealing with the surface, the, the surface manifestation of what's going on, but it gets right to the heart. And that's the power of the gospel, isn't it? Uh, that, which, which is what we need to be constantly offering. Um, you know, when you, when you mentioned um, allowing the gospel to have sort of the central place in how we think through these social issues, um, I wonder if like a corollary to that is that like the gospel will speak to specific sins in specific cultures. So like when John the Baptist is preaching repentance, you know, he tells the soldiers don't, you know, don't, I can't remember what he told them. The tax collectors take only what is due, right? Um, and the, the soldiers he told to be satisfied with their wages. So he's addressing, he's bringing the gospel to bear on their particular situations. Mm -hmm. um, and so maybe that's, that's one of the things that if we're only dealing with people like in our churches or in our neighborhoods on the basis of their groups, it's a lot harder to do that. Mm -hmm. But if you approach me and say, you know, as a businessman, mm -hmm. or if you're in the medical field, or if you're a police officer, if you're a school teacher, when you, you get to looking at how the, what specific temptations to partiality there might be, it's now a lot easier for you to unpack how the Word of God can speak to your situation, to where you can actually hold it and evaluate your actions and say, how am I doing? You know, and that's that the gospel invites us to look at our specific situations because partiality is just one sin among many, right? The gospel also speaks to pride, you know, the kind of pride that can be um, causing a lot of the, the tension and hostility we have in our culture today. Well, let's, let's bring this down to very specifically talking about the things that are really tearing at our, at our American society today. Uh, some, of the, some of the ideas that are being um, proliferated out there that are, at, at, to some degree, the cause of this. Uh, there's, there's no doubt that there is a history of very unjust partiality and dehumanization in our country. Um, and, 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 and we're just speaking, you know, we're not talking about other countries. We're just, you know, right here, right here at home. Let's just talk about that, okay? Um, what are some of the things that are driving the reaction to this? Bobby, maybe you can speak to that. You presented a, a pizza and perspectives here one time, and, and there's, you know, identity politics, and there's uh, the critical race theory and things like that. So help us understand as the church, what are, what are some of the ideas that are driving this? And let's, then let's talk about how does the gospel respond to this? Um, there is a, a consistent, we've talked about how treating people in the basis of group identity, you know, and that's, that's, a, that's a persistent um, habit that shows itself in a lot of these different arenas of life. And if I can read from a dictionary here, a, a tendency for people of a particular religion, race, social background, etc., to form exclusive political alliances, moving away from traditional broad-based party politics. I mean, so that, that can show itself, and that's why it seems like there's these certain issues, whether it's on you know, sexual ethics, economics, racial tension, political parties, these different sorts of polarizations can lead to a sort of entrenchment. So when there, does, when there is the opportunity for engagement, it's, it's very rare for there to be any kind of crossover or even any kind of understanding you know, so there's, there's, a, there's, there's rarely, and you, you may see the kind of meme on occasion where you'll have people that are like the Jew and the Samaritan actually interacting with one another, but they're few and far between, right? And, and that's what it sort of, uh, it, it, I think you had said earlier, it, it encourages hostility. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's really reinforces hostility. So what, what gets the most traction on social media or the news? 
it's the inflammatory actions. It's the pro, it's it's a it's the riot that turned ugly. You know, and the kinds of things that don't get a lot of attention are the quiet conversations. You know, the conversations that happen at the Waffle House, or you know, that that's the that's what you don't see as much. Um, and do you think that that's those conversations, those one-on-one or small group conversations, do you think that those happen often mm. or can happen more? Mm. Um, that, that's a good question, and I, I, I don't know. I mean, it, it's, it, I had a conversation with my parents about this kind of thing, too, because it's the sort of thing that you're, you think it must just happen. What we see on the news, the, the normal tendency is for us to assume that's just what it's like everywhere, yeah. every, every little corner of your neighborhoods and that's what it's like but by and large when you think of the number of people represented on television versus how many people we have in our country and how the society seems to carry itself on normally it, maybe maybe not you know but we have to embrace the perspective that we have to work from the margins so it's just kind of like we're doing our thing and that again and again if you think to specific people you know whatever your vocation is that's where the, the work, the culture work would be done. And there was a Tim Scott uh, senator in uh, South Carolina, and there was another sem- senator, a Democrat, and a Republican working together. They said there will be no single government policy that will fix racial tension in our country. You can ask us all day to do it, and it won't happen. What it will happen is on Sunday afternoon over the lunch table. They said that's where you guys will begin to work through this cultural problem. Mm, yeah, very true. Very true. Um, the question that I think should, should be asked, that I think every one of us should ask ourselves and ask it very honestly, regardless of from what angle you approach this whole issue, is first ask yourself the question, what narrative am I following? What is, what is the world view? What narrative? Am I following the narrative of what we would call cultural Marxism, critical race theory, intersectionality, what's being, what's being taught in in the, the college classrooms, uh, those theories that, that inherently divide people into classes and groups. Uh, am, am I following that? Am I following um, the news? A particular, am I following this news or this news? Because most news today isn't really news. It's, it's them telling you what they want you to think about something. Uh, that's a little editorial comment there, but, um, and, and there's just so much of it. And, and you can watch so much news where it develops in you, uh, it, it builds a rut, an, an attitudinal rut about how I perceive all of this. And you can become cynical after listening to the news for too long. So, uh, or, or am I being informed by the life-transforming truth of God's Word? Do I, how do I view people? Do I view them through the lens of Scripture? The way to test in that is like if you say, I, I'm going to dismiss what this person is saying because this person's white or this person's black. So his perspective does not matter. You know, and that, that's a good way of testing where you are on the uh, group identity. There's, a, there's an apologist named Neil Shinvey who's just done a ton of work on the subject. And, he has a, a real powerful presentation he does on identity politics. And at the very end of his presentation, he tells evangelical Christians, he says, now, I'm going to encourage you to read more widely. And what he does is he plays a, he shows a screen, and it's got about nine different faces of black men on there. He says, now, maybe you look at that screen and you're like, you just told us to read widely. These are all black men. And he says, well, haven't you been listening to my talk? What, do all black men think the same? And if you look, all of these men represent a wide spectrum of political beliefs. You know, so if you take Cornel West and Thomas Sowell and Ty Nehisi Coates, there's a wide variety of perspectives represented. And so his point was to say, you need to overcome the, the sort of normal metrics that we use for evaluating whether I'm going to listen to this person or not. But we re- respond by listening to individuals. Which this was Martin Luther King's legacy, right? That we would be judged on the basis of our, our character, not on the color of our skin, yeah. what we're doing and what we say. So understanding others. Uh, let me ask you, Deontay, how, how important is it in, 
because you favor the small group conversation, the one-on-one, -on -one, the small group conversation, as for judging from what you said. How important is it that we learn to listen to each other to understand? How important is it for me to understand your perspective on an issue, from, from your experience and your perspective on an issue? Well, I think it crushes the whole idea of my experience or the whole idea of social media informing me. If the only way, I'm, if I'm listening to you directly, then I have no excuse to listen to social media. You're telling me what you believe. Whereas if I'm looking at social media, they're telling me what you believe. Mm -hmm. And from there it becomes misconceptions. Uh, from there you can make uh, wrong assumptions. Mm -hmm. But if I'm talking with you directly or both of you, then I'm going to pretty soon find out that we're not too far apart. Mm -hmm. We may have some disagreements, but I'm handling it with you directly. I'm understanding you better. And I think a big part of why there's many uh, wrongful assumptions, that there's uh, people talking uh, over each other, is because they're not listening to each other. They don't care what the other person has to say. Uh, I also think with small one-on-one -on -one groups, you're, it creates an environment to be honest. Uh, yeah, because you don't have a mob right, you preparing don't, you don't, to jump right, on you if you say right. the wrong thing. As in, like, if, if I type something in social media, yeah. people can easily take yeah. it it's the wrong public. way. Yeah. yeah, and now you're labor, labeled yeah. this, that, yeah. and the other. Yeah. But if I'm talking to you, yeah. I'm only focused on you, yeah. and I can't explain myself to you. And if I say something you disagree with, you can press me on yes. it. You can say, well, look, have you considered this, or let me, yes. let me push this further, and that in-person conversation really gives you much more opportunity for doing that. Yeah. Rather than, you know, now I've got I've got nine people that I don't even know. Yes, that you have to, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, it can be, it can get very chaotic very quickly. Yeah. Um, and so I think, again, I think one of you say it starts with those uh, Sunday, you know, afternoon conversations mm -hmm. over the table talk, mm -hmm. you know. And those don't happen, at least not for me, naturally in my experience. You know, it's just that those that, that will take some work. You have to be intentional about it. Yeah. 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 But it's a good thing to develop and practice. The first thing people have to do is get back to eating meals together, right? <laughs> well, the funny thing is, we have, like, a lot of our neighbors, they really keep to themselves. And so the coronavirus has definitely not helped that. But we just got a puppy. And so now neighbors are coming out of the woodworks to come see the puppy playing in the yard. So like we should have got a puppy a long time ago. <laughs> Let cultural engagement go buy a dog. So I, I, I'm talking about questions that we need to ask each other. And the second one that I would like to propose, it, it kind of builds off of what I just asked you. But what informs your perception of those people? Whoever those people are, right? The only way a perception of those people can be formed is by me refusing to talk to an individual and get to know an individual, right? Somebody who is different than I am, somebody who could just look different, maybe a different skin color, somebody in a different socioeconomic class. I hate to even use that terminology because I think it rails against the gospel, but somebody from a different culture, somebody from a different faith system, Am I willing to be intentional about listening to them, getting to know them as a person? Because you know, it's much easier to hate a group mm -hmm. uh -huh. than it is to hate a person that you know personally. Because a group is an with. abstraction. A group is an abstraction, yeah. Yeah. that's right. Yeah. And that's, that's what we're doing today. We're just pitting one group yeah. against another. Yeah. And these systems that are ostensibly bringing the answer to us are only exacerbating that very problem. Yeah, I, I feel that when we do take that step and begin to interact with those people, they can quickly become my people. Mm -hmm. um, you take, because you have a personal relationship with them. As, mm -hmm. as long as you're distant, they're gonna always be those people. Mm -hmm. But when you, when you know them personally, when you sat down and had a conversation with them, when you realize, hey, you know, what I've been hearing about you isn't true. Mm -hmm. Now, no, that, this is my brother, this is my sister, you know, I know them. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, again, that distance, uh, it, it numbs you. Mm -hmm. And think of how slow and how 
um, that that's much more like growing trees than it is growing corn. You know, that, that takes a long time to cultivate those kinds of relationships. And that's, it goes back to working from the margins. You know, the, the church has to be patient enough to do that kind of work. And that's hard when you're like, well, I've got thousands of friends on social media, you know, where, where you're used to a sense of knowing large numbers of people, but not at that level, where you're comfortable interacting with them and cultivating the, the relational space to be able to ask difficult questions and to be asked difficult yeah. questions. Part of the reality that's driving this today, it just seems that things are so, just so polarized and jaded, right? That, that the, the conventional wisdom is that if, if you disagree with me, then you hate me, mm-hmm. right? Now, mm-hmm. probably not everybody is going to say that, but we kind of behave that yeah. way, don't we? If, if you can't affirm what I feel or what I believe, then you hate me. And that's just patently false. And, and this is, a, a, again, this is a place where Christians can rise up to the occasion and truly shine. And that is to be able to, first of all, take the initiative to get to know someone and interact with them, learn about them, and then love them even regardless of how much they may disagree with you or your worldview, but you love them, you live the gospel in front of them or you live the gospel to them, that is a very, very powerful apologetic. And some people aren't even gonna know how to respond to that because unfortunately they've never seen that before, you know? Um, but to, to be able to listen to someone and interact with them and still love them and respect them regardless of how much they may disagree with you, that is a very, very powerful virtue to which the church needs to return. And Paul says that's, that's where we see the glory of God. And we see how good God is in that. God showed His love to us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You know, we were enemies you know, we were enemies of Jesus. And, and so how much more, if He took the actions He did on our behalf, you know, our own actions on behalf of those who form all kinds of harsh prejudices against us, you know, we still have the calling of the gospel. We have the assurance of God's backing us, right? Mm-hmm. Who, who can bring any charge against God's elect? You know, mm-hmm. that's, that can be spoken of the church. That should give us unbounded courage to be spoken ill of, you know, to be persecuted. Um, to be misunderstood because God understands us, you know, and that gives me the social space to be able to go and to be vulnerable and to interact with people of all different stripes and different communities. And I mean, James one, he that he makes that that basis, my brother, and do not hold your faith. So the faith that you believe, mm-hmm. your faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, with an attitude of personal favoritism or partiality, mm-hmm. he, based on your faith which you just elaborated on, that God, you know, loved us and died for us while we were yet sinners. Based on that, don't go and act otherwise. Act the same. Be children of God. Uh, Act your status. Act your status. That's good. That's good words. Gentlemen, thank you. Uh, uh, Let me just uh, invite you now as as we're wrapping this down. Let me just... uh, put this question out for you. What do we need to do? I mean, with, with things the way they are now in the streets, the, the raw tension that is there, the fear that many people have of even saying the wrong thing. Speak to us as the church of Jesus Christ, ambassadors of the gospel of grace in Jesus Christ. What do we need to do? If, if, if pose you that question, if there's one thing, maybe two things, that you they say, this is the, these are the next steps we need to take. What do we need to do as the church? Um, share that with us. I'll say one thing, because I, I have two, but I'll, I'll say, say one thing here. My care group has been talking about this every week for, for some time, namely our attitudes. As a lot of things happen in the news, and how do we pray for one another with our attitudes. And Larry Newby shared, hey, he's very intentional about his relationship to the news. News is important. He listens to the news, but he's very intentional about when he listens to it and how much of it. So he's like, I'll get, uh, be on one time a day or something like that. So regular intervals, that can be different for all of us, but we all need to really understand 
um, how much of this is healthy for me and it's informing me in a healthy way and how much of it is tyrannizing my mind right. and, and, and forming me in the wrong way. Because all of these habits are formative and we want to be formed into the kind of people that can respond in the right way at the right time. And in order for us to do that, we have to be walking with God. And if, if the news are a stumbling block, then we need to take a step back. And it does have an off button. You can, you can turn <laughs> it, it off. Yes. Yeah. yeah, very good. You said you had two? Yeah, yeah. So uh, also, just in, if we have, we're evaluating our relationship there, mm-hmm. think the long game. You know, sometimes uh, the acuteness of these problems, like when you see riots going on, you think we got to come up with a solution right now because these are really big problems. But I, I think the Holy Spirit's approach is always we're thinking longer and we're 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 going to go deep we're not going to develop shallow responses to this um, and so if we can think about rather than thinking of people in the abstract or or dealing with this or that group think about someone that you know mm-hmm. that you could prayerfully build a relationship with yes even just to learn something that you didn't know um, you know don't have a grand plan for fixing all the world's problems, but just right. developing a relationship with the Lord, the Lord's help. Like that, that would be, if all of us did that, mm-hmm. that could be felt at a real mm-hmm. community level and expanding out. Yes, definitely. Just yeah. piggybacking on what you said, uh, especially, you know, the one-on-one conversations, specifically conversations with people you disagree with yeah. or people that are different from you yeah. to as hard as it may be to go, go out of that comfort zone mm-hmm. and really, uh, Test yourself in that regard. A lot of self-reflection. Um, when I'm listening to the news, am I treating the news as if it's scripture? Mm-hmm. That mm-hmm. what it say is true, mm-hmm. and that's how I'm supposed to react based on what it says. Or am I supposed to react based on what scripture says? Mm-hmm. How how are you really responding to the information given? Mm-hmm. If you think if you don't think twice about what scripture says, but you hold much weight to what someone on TV says, mm-hmm. that speaks a lot mm-hmm. to, uh, you know, the, your authority, mm-hmm. you know, your ultimate authority. Mm-hmm. But I would say uh, interact with those who are different than you mm-hmm. in ideology and in appearance um, because, uh, you know, God does not see as man sees. Mm-hmm. Uh, man looks at appearances. God looks at the heart. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Very true. And there, you know, our supreme example in this is the Lord Jesus Christ. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, right? What did he do? He considered others more important than himself. There is not a human being alive who does not bear the image of God. And, and, and so be, by, and this is something else that James says, by virtue of the fact that they are human beings created in God's image, it is inappropriate for you to praise God at one point and to be cursing your fellow man at another point. It is wholly inappropriate. It is incongruous. And, and so we need to make sure that the gospel touches all of my interactions with all other people. And, and your point to, to having those personal conversations is very, very important. And what we need to be very careful about is that that personal conversation doesn't degenerate into a yeah, but, yeah, but. Uh, and, and then you start getting hot under the collar. That's counterproductive. That's, that only builds walls, you know, and be able to listen to someone with whom you disagree. It's so important. Uh, and we just think about, you know, how God invested him. He came to us. He took the initiative to come to us and invest himself in us. Let that gospel be the compass of our interactions with each other. Bobby, I interrupted yeah. you. No, 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 I was going to interrupt you. Uh, uh, we, I, I made a practice one time to say when I'm going into a conversation where I know there's likely to be tension, mm-hmm. more often than not, if I'm, if I'm not really sure of where I stand on that, to say, I'm going to make this a listening conversation. Yes. I speak enough, right? right? right. It's hard to get me to shut up. So it's like in this conversation, I'm going to listen and ask questions. And particularly when you're talking about a lot of the issues we've talked about here, 
um, I'll ask for definitions. So just because like, I want to understand what you mean when you use this word, because I don't know that we mean the same thing. And asking that question, that can actually lead to some productive conversation because that person gets the feeling that I'm actually thinking about what they're saying. Not I'm not thinking about my response to what yeah. they're saying. And right. that really helps to just give you a little bit of relational collateral for saying, now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you some more questions or, well, you know. And it's important to think that ultimately we want, generally we want the same things. We want peace, we want justice, we want harmony, right? The differences come about in how we arrive at those things. But again, in those personal interactions, as I'm listening, let's make sure that we're not just simply bantering from the perspective of opinion. We have a solid reference point, a solid foundation and so let that be our foundation. It's not a hammer, it's the light, and it's not a laser, right? We're not, we're not trying to destroy people with truth. We're trying to win them with truth. And, and that truth has to, first, has to have first transformed my heart. And, and as it is working in me and transforming me into the image of Jesus Christ and to live out His bold compassion that He had towards us. Gentlemen, thank you so much for your input, your insights on this. I really, really do appreciate it. And uh, Deontay Parti, thank you. Bobby Locklear, uh, thank you for joining me in the conversation. And uh, I hope this has been helpful to you. Uh, if you would like to respond to it, if you have questions or you'd like to make comments, we would love to hear from you. You can respond to pastor at gbcnc.org. And uh, we look forward to interacting with you. Uh, we hope you will join us again next time. Thank you, though, for joining us for this special edition of the Roundtable. Uh, it has been a Bible study, very good discussion. And uh, God bless you. We'll see you next time.